Okay. <clears throat> testing, testing. I hope this is going live. This is the first time I've tried uh, Hangouts. I have a esteemed guest on tonight, Theophilus Pellis, otherwise known as Logos of Ophiel. I'm just going to have to do a few little things to get started. The first thing is send him, oh no, 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 not that. This one, excuse me if you're here. There he goes. So tonight we are going to be, I'm quite nervous tonight actually, I don't know if this is working. I, I We did do a little like five minute test beforehand and my sound was quite bad, although um, Logos of Ophiel, my guest, his sounded fine, so it'll be interesting to see how it goes. I will check on chat to see if anybody's in the house. It doesn't tell me here at all, I don't think. Well, three viewers, it does, so thank you. Welcome, whoever you are. I'll find out in a minute. So tonight we're going to be going over the topic of the famous Holy Guardian Angel. There's... Uh, there he is now. Oh, yeah, I'm here. Okay, cool. I hear a slight echo on my end. Is my sound okay? Oh, I hear you. Okay, excellent. Oh, yeah, I'm here. <clears throat> Tune in to my uh, chat. I guess we could just give a little uh, broad sort of introduction. Uh, I'm sure everybody uh, has probably knows who you are already. Logos of Ophiel, a very experienced magician. I've uh, uh, heard you say you've, you started practicing when you were like 18 years old? Uh, 16, 15 or 16 actually. Wow, so that's a, a long time in the, the magic uh, uh, profession really. It's kind of a profession for you I think. So yeah, I just turned 32 the 9th of this month so it's yeah. been close to 16 years. Yeah, that's that's a long time to be doing magic, and and did it kind of slowly uh, build? I mean, you didn't do rituals every day when you were you were sixteen. I, I take it you gradually sort of uh, got more and more into it. Um, it's more or less one of those things that where I dabbled uh, more than anything at first. Uh, I started doing spells to begin with, and at first I was kind of like. I don't know if this is going to work or not, but I'll give it a try. And my first spell was an astral magic spell. It's where I traveled in the astral and I, I charged up my blade. So uh, now that I look back, uh, I forget how advanced that really was for my first spell. So that's that's sort of what kicked off everything. And it wasn't later till I think I was right around 24 when I st really started looking back at some of my early magic, how advanced some of the techniques were and all of that. So uh, it kind of, it was something I've always been good at. Yeah. So what? Uh, how did you first get your, your first rituals and stuff? What book did you, or was that a teacher? I know you do have a teacher. Mm -hmm. How did you come to magic in the first place? What was like your entry text? Um, I actually started with an experience first. I'm sure everybody knows it at this point. It all started with a shadow person experience, uh, some sort of paranormal experience, and it was soon afterwards that something happened, and my friends were pretty freaked out, and I wanted to find answers. However, I ultimately decided to uh, check out ritual works. I, I, I looked at some ritual works when the internet was fairly new. And this is when computers started with, uh, you know, landlines. <laughs> do, do you remember yeah. the old AOL? Yeah. The D, D, D. yeah. It was so slow. But uh, it, also, it all started back in that time. Yeah. It's, so, it's like the thriving uh, magical scene uh, 
very early on in the computer chat rooms and stuff, I think there was a good deal of it was chaos magic in those days, wasn't it? Oh, this was even um, I would I would say even even a little bit be before that period. This is when the AOL was big, uh, Netscape was still around, then Microsoft was starting to become a monopoly, and I just started out with actually actually like New Age rituals at the time. So uh, then I got deeper into ritual after the army. And I started to look more towards uh, Crowley and Thelema. Uh, Crowley introduced me to the beauty of ritual and how far it could go. But later on, uh, I think it's after I found the Greek magical papyri that I started to realize, you know, how a lot of these same concepts were so much deeper, especially in the religious mode of things. And uh, I, I started to re respect and look deeper into the whole religiosity of ritual. And I find them deeper than what I found a lot of Thelema rituals, a lot of more personalized rituals, because uh, the art of ritual really hit me, I think, when I saw what they represented in a cosmology and what they represented in... Uh, a theological base, the deeper concepts of life, death, uh, rebirth, resurrection, um, you know, the harvest, the grain, and those more pragmatic parts of life that really matter at survival, such as rituals to certain stars and the skies and stuff like that. So Crowley was my advance point, but these older rituals, they had much more depth and tied much more into nature. Yeah. That's beautiful. I love what you say that uh, Crowley introduced you to the beauty of rituals. But uh, you know, there's so much beauty in the older systems as well, and especially as we're going to be focusing on the Holy Guardian Angel. There's a whole uh, ancient systems of attaining this state of consciousness, or however you describe it, to the, the Holy Guardian Angel. You know, a lot of people think it, it, it only exists in the Lemma, or I kind of did. But uh, mm -hmm. Socrates had a daemon, and uh, you could maybe tell us a little bit about your understanding of what the daemon or the creative genius or the, the holy guardian angel actually is. Yeah, that's no problem. Um, it's undergone some terminology changes due to modern subjectivism. You know, I see myself as more of an objectivist. Uh, uh, I'm I'm probably a little more black and white than a lot of people with this because I look into history, ontology, and uh, systemology and things like that. So uh, to make one thing clear, when we're talking about the Holy Guardian Angel, we're not talking about a left-hand path version. We're not talking about where simply any deity can be a Holy Guardian Angel. Um, what we're talking about here is something entirely different. So pro let's go back a little bit. Let's go back to uh, 1900. During this period, Crowley underwent the most recent translation and the only English translation of the Abermellon operation. Now, this was revolutionary for the time once it came out later. And a lot of people held the um, Aubermellon operation to such a high self-esteem because of Crowley's influence. Anything Crowley touched, people worshipped right off the bat. So it was natural for them to forget about the previous history. So um, as, I'm, as I went through this, and as I started to really understand this a little more. Uh, let's start with the journey here. I've, I originally found the concept through Angels of Chaos, and luckily the magician was a lot more Thelemic traditional. That led me to Crowley in his introduction in Book 4. And after the introduction in Book 4, it led me to the sacred magic of Abermel and the Mage. And really, 
the sacred magic of Abermel and a mage was the first thing which blew me up. Uh, it, it blew my mind. So I, I pursued that. Then afterwards, I went to this um, book that my friend Jesse at the time recommended. Love the man today. Good guy. And it was Jason Augustus Newcomb's 21st Century Mage because I was ready for the ritual. But later on, after I interviewed George Dinn, I started to look deeper into Greek philosophy as of it. And it's just written all over. It's even found in Renaissance magic. And historically, uh, let's begin with the Renaissance magicians. Uh, even before Abraham von Worms wrote the Book of Abermelon, Agrippa writes in, I think it's Book 3, Chapter 26, or Chapter 22, something like that, that man is gifted with three entities. You know, the Holy Guardian Angel, which expounds uh, holy secrets, the Angel of Nativity, which helps the magician in more practical matters. And then there's the Angel of Profession. This was an angel that helped you in, in like your job and stuff like that. So um, Agrippa mentions it very briefly. He says the concept came from Egypt, which was interesting. Um, but later on, I would have to say I started to look into Neoplatonism, which heavily endorsed this. Uh, I started to read into Plotinus, and Plotinus, and if you ever read his Aeneids, it was said somewhere in there that one of his friends was a friend to an Egyptian priest. And to impress Plotinus, they went to the Temple of Isis to uh, summon a, 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 an inner daimon or whatever. And this Egyptian priest said, Plotinus, you're very fortunate. Your daimon is is, is, uh, is a holy spirit, which was interesting. Cool. cool. So, um, later on, uh, I, I think it was Porphyry who walked in on him while he was in the middle of, in the middle of meditation, and he saw the, like this black mass hovering above hovering above Plotinus while he was in Rome. And uh, it, it, it was wild. It, uh, Porphyry was kind of mind blown from it, from his meditation, watching this uh, black mass. And there, there was a lot of Eastern influence there because Plotinus says he was heavily inspired from the Hindus and the Persians. So he, get, he, he really gets the idea of of Plato, which states some sort of inner oracle, and through some Eastern thought, according to Porphyry, uh, the, medit the meditative and a praxis of some of the East applied to uh, Plotinus's work was how he approached the inner daimon. But then we have Socrates. I, 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 I finally finished up the entire book of his complete works. And he was down by a river, and there was this meadow and stuff, and there was this inner voice, and this inner voice randomly told Socrates to, you know, stop and make a sacrifice because somehow he offended the gods. So he did that, and and he said he had the gift since he was a child, so it, there was really no ritual there. Socrates said that there's always been that inner oracle, as we would call today, the holy guardian angel so there was another experience to where socrates said he would be a politician if his inner oracle did not uh if his inner oracle told him not to do it and i think if i remember right the greek word for this was daimonian and um so it's really interesting with how this has always played a part. Even Gnostics believed to unite with God. The only way to do, do this was to connect with your holy guardian angel. So, and I think it was in Valentinia, Valentinianism uh, back 2,000 years ago. But like I said, uh, 
And, and this idea was quite common, especially when we look into PGM with personal, uh, personal daimons, personal assistants. And it was a common thread in this universal Mediterranean um, magic. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, the paper trips was something I've been up into kind of uh, through your influence, and it's very fascinating. I like the idea of astral magic. And it's a kind of visionary magic as well. I've been reading about uh, subfumication, subfum you know, when they're, they're basically mm -hmm. blowing clouds of narcotic uh, incenses and stuff. I wonder mm -hmm. how much that plays into the phenomena of angels and, you know, Grimoires are very interesting. Um, so what rituals was it that you uh, were using when your guardian angel first made contact with you, and how did it make contact? Um, I used the outline of Jason Augustus Newcomb, but I took a little, mu little bit more of a traditional route um, in some aspects. Uh, I was reading the Zohar and the, and the Torah every day, wow. and I was meditating on the concepts and i think it was right around, around that period uh, it really blew my ego out of the water i i did the recommended stuff i did more of the devotional method i'd wake up every day i'd pray i would uh light my incense and um use my auburn melon oil uh so i actually found it my holy guardian angel in a much shorter time span because there was this disabled girl she was um what was it she was born brain dead so she couldn't walk she couldn't speak and it still kind of chokes me up today because she was so limited in her capabilities yet her only capability was that she could smile and that's it that i mean that's it she could smile so with what's going on there um because the point of the holy guardian angel and uh, there was a little more of the golden dawn approach and i still apply this golden dawn approach to what the holy guardian angel was it is uh, divine innocence so upon listening to divine innocence when i met this little girl this brain dead girl this was the epitome of divine innocence. She was 11 years old. She can't make no mistakes. You know what I mean? She, she can't have an ego. She can't have a lot of these same flaws that we have. So in a way, her spirit was pure. And, and that really knocked me on my ass. Out of all of it. Out of everything. I do. I I look back and and it still baffles me today. I think about this little disabled girl, and you know a lot of people they like to conceptualize divine innocence, but if you want to see divine innocence, I mean, go to some of these people who who actually do have disabilities who are struggling. I mean, it's right in front of your face, uh -huh. and it hit me really hard because. When we think about the concept of the, of divine innocence and the plus daily ritual and the goal to find a holy guardian angel uh, through daily prayer and study, meditation, practice, and all of that, then there's a third aspect that was occurring that was getting closer with God. Now, when I say God, I'm not strictly talking about you know a Jewish God. I don't think I've ever applied this to a Jewish God. But it was more of a pantheist God. You know, I don't think any book or any text will be able to clearly define God. And I this is where I think that the Greeks had it right. So, I and I've always felt that, and I've always kind of uh, applied that. But it, it was more or less the disciplines that I followed, even if they were a little more religious-based. But one thing that I can say is with the application of this little girl... And the methods I used um, with daily prayer, study, pra study practice, I do the same stuff today. Uh, actually, I still do my daily prayers and all that and uh, the same practice. And then I never, I never really stopped. And then you apply the idea of getting closer to God. I mean, you mix that all together. I mean, 
it just sort of sped up the process faster than what I thought. Um, I actually, before I left Facebook, I had a really good conversation with Aaron Leach. Uh, uh, actually, before I got kicked off Facebook, I should say. Uh, I wanted to leave anyway, but they kind of gave me the excuse. But um, I had a really good conversation with him. And he, he kind of looked at looked at the text and he says, wow, you really understand it, don't you? I'm like, uh, I think my response was like, yeah, I've been, you know, experiencing this for since 2011, but I've been studying it for closer to 10 years. So it's kind of always hung in there in my life. Yeah. An amazing uh, story. That's absolutely beautiful. The chat loved it as well. I'll give everybody a shout in chat out later after we've talked, but uh, it's so mm -hmm. fascinating. So how did you know that you'd made contact with the angel and how did it communicate to you? Okay, well, the thing is there's a lot of lesser spirits and unclean spirits that will make a claim that they are um, that they are spirits. But, you know, me and Tallyson was on the phone the other day. I've, we've been friends, I think, since 2011. And I'm sure he's going to make a video about this. Uh, but there was this period to where we said, you know, that a lot of these spirits will say that they're gods. A lot of these spirits will say that they're demons or that they're your angel. And, and this is a real issue with some people. But the thing is, when you're working with your holy guardian angel, there's a lot of coincidences happening at that time. Um, I mean, as an example... Uh, I know when my holy guardian angel is at work because of the timing of everything. I started my lunar initiation this year. And here's an example. Uh, on September 9th of 2018, the day of the new moon, I started to work with my planetary initiation and, um, and my planetary magic. So it was a little bit after that. I, I adopted a name three or four years ago three or four years ago, Delphalos Palace. And um, I kind of kept, I, I kind of brought it to the public, but I retracted that a little bit. But uh, I, I came across this name, the Ophelos, uh, in a Platonic dialogue. And I think it's where Plato was discussing names. I forget the exact one, but I think that's the one. But the Ophelos um, quite literally means friend of God. And, um, there was also, Pelace was the bloodline of Achilles. So it was one of those things that I've kind of kept private. And, um, and it really resonated with me. And, and the name quite literally translates to Pelace, friend of God. And it's like the act of energy of God. And it, not just after that, but with the timing of the new moon, with the way everything was happening on the lunary basis, there's there just some really weird things that fit so perfectly. I got, um, I found more secrets in Neoplatonism. Uh, there were things happening in my life with my family and with my friends that it, that just occurred. Uh, you know, uh, you know, the same year I was working with my Holy guardian angel. Um, what was it? Uh, you know, and that's just this year. Back in 2011, uh, there was this, um, uh, the, where, when I was working with the Holy Guardian Angel and doing my rituals, uh, it was kind of funny because my tire uh, pretty much got flat off my car. I was working on putting, a, putting the donut on, and some guy who was also a magician, he really helped me out. And, and and it came to uh, it it came out. I saw he was like a also an occultist, not a neo pagan, but an actual occultist. So I'm like, oh wow, you know. And uh, then I was I got closer with my teacher. And a little bit after that, uh, I would have to say, uh, I was I have my own language. I I don't release some stuff on the internet, and but I will talk about some of it openly. And what you're comfortable with. Yeah. But um, I have my own language. It's called Tote. And, and it's kind of funny how the name Tote came around because my friend, 
And once again, divine innocence here, my friend at the time, she's, I think she's like, I, I don't know how old she is now, probably 10 or 11. But at the time she was three years old. I'll never forget. I jokingly asked her, what should I call my language? You know, my magical language. And she said, tote. And then it was uh, probably 2016. I, I kind of jokingly accepted it because it was cute and it came from that innocence, right? Then later on, Thoth, the actual, you know, you have the Egyptian name of Thoth, but then once it got translated in English, it was never translated as Thoth or Thoth. It was Tut because the H was silent. It was a breathing sound. So it was Tut. So, so my personal language I've been using for eight years is Tot. And he's the god of language, so... Uh... Yeah, uh-huh. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, that's a, so you have all these uh, confluences of, of uh, coincidences, and that's probably a bad word. I don't, I don't know what else to call it. But then after you have these influences through experience... You, you just kind of know because you start to pick up the numerology on things. You start to, you know, you get little things with kids and, and your teachers, your people around you. And then there's this genuine feeling that this isn't just a regular spirit. There is a holiness to this because, of, and uh, uh, I don't think I talked about this in a method, but the method is about holiness. It, it's about getting away from the vices in order to connect and stripping away the ego it, and not, not because God says so, not because the Holy Guardian Angel says so, because it's about mastery of the self, not becoming a slave to a habit. Mm -hmm. Because when you can start to control your own body, when you can start to control your emotions, when you can really start to control um, aspects of yourself, and this is why shadow work is so important, then that there's a reason why there's a ritual process there. And um, so after you have these influences, you do the ritual, you have your daily practices. It may not seem like a lot to a lot of people, but, but, it, but once you tie the ritual with the um, experiences and, and um, all of that, and then th there's a certain thing like, like this holiness it's almost like a godliness it's not it's i can't say it's an overwhelming feeling because it's so subtle but overwhelming and there's no way to describe it sometimes it comes through intuitively other times it comes through in dreams um there was a there was a dream i had and i really think that this was pythagoras but my working table happened uh, when I started doing security over at Kellogg's, and um, there was, I, I think my angel, maybe it could have been my angel, I don't know, but I was having a dream, and it it was my holy guardian angel guiding me, and there was this old man with the beard, he had the toga and stuff, and um, and and he showed me something. He raised up this picture. Of this dodecagram with the snake and it had all these lines in there but after working with geometry for so long i kind of caught the shape of it and then i saw the figures of the of, of the monad to the decad and then i woke up from that dream and and i hurry up and i took note of it before i forgot about it and um later on i i did research and this is a part of pythagorean cosmology so I started to realize I was blessed with a working table. Is that the logo by any chance? The that symbol that you have on the logos of Ophiel? Uh yeah, but there's more lines. There's uh there's nine other lines tacked on to each point. So there's fifty five lines in total. Rather than just a ten. Cool. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, yeah, it was a working table that Pythagoras gave me. So, But you'll know, because it's just holy, it's special. You know, it's almost, it's, it's, you, you can tell it's not God, because obviously Plotinus had his own take on that, but but it was special. Yeah. It was holy. 
Yeah, I, I was uh, reading that the Greeks sort of saw the the guardian angel as a somewhere between God and man. Yeah, uh, or, or a messenger. Oh yeah, that comes from Plato. Uh, Plato said, I think it's in the Timaeus or, or it has to be the Timaeus or the Critias, but but he says that every man has his own individual holy guardian angel. So by that definition, uh, it can't simply be a god, you know, like like a like a sub deity, you know, there because that's a god for everybody. So what Plato is saying here, that th this is a particular spirit, that this is uh, something that you're born with, and um, yeah, it's it, and it and its goal is to give you divine knowledge, and it is a medium. It's 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 a, the best way I can describe it is a mercurial aspect, right? Yeah. And in this mercurial aspect, um, think of it this way, right? Let, uh, the Emerald Tablets really talks about this the best way uh, because it's setting up a three-dimensional figure. You know, uh, that which is above is that which is below. And if you look, you know, you have the above and below. Then it says the sun is its uh, father, the moon is its mother. And, um, and what you have here, is the sun on the right and the moon on the left. So now we have sort of this cross figure to uh, to create the miracle of one thing. And this is, once again, pure Pythagorean uh, Holy Guardian angel stuff. And I don't think a lot of people realize it, but the uh, Emerald Tablet is very strictly Pythagorean. And, and, and the goal, I don't think Pythagoras set the goal to meet the Holy Guardian angel. I don't recall any mention of it, but there is kind of a, a mention of it in a way too. It's about that middle space between uh, heaven and earth. Um, it's not quite uh, terrestrial, but not quite celestial either. Um, we have the triad and the triad. I don't know. I can't pull up the shapes or anything. And when we have, you have the monad, which is the one it's God. And then everything manifests within the one because you can't go outside of the one. And that's even true today. So then you have the dyad where the one splits. It's seen as bad. You know, you have good, bad, right, left, and all of this. So it, it's uh, very much tied to contention and negativity. And then you have the, um, the, um, the tetrad. And the tetrad is is the earth but the thing is you know what's that medium between the dyad and the tetrad the two and the four it's the triad and the triad unites the two and it's a miniature version of god this is where the first idea of the microcosm and the macrocosm have ever been uh graphed if we look at the pre-socratics um they don't unify this like Pythagoras does, not Empedocles, not Heraclitus, um, you know, not even the Milesians. They, they, they never talked about the microcosm or even influenced it like Pythagoras has. And the, uh, what's interesting here is I, I love the pre-Socratics. I mean, Heraclitus, he was a hell of a hell of a poet but what pythagoras did was very different um he completely if it wasn't for him i don't know if, if we would have the process termed with the holy guardian angel the way we do personally he was the he was the start of it if it wasn't for pythagoras we wouldn't have the um we wouldn't have the emerald tablets because the emerald tablets strictly defines pythagorean cosmology so i i really think in the western version it all begins with pythagoras yeah absolutely i mean there's the oh there's that tree again <laughs> yeah there's the neoplatonic uh way of thinking of things as there being a pre-existing world uh that magic somehow taps into uh 
and the, there's a similar to a Kabbalistic idea, you know, you were talking about everything issuing from the one. So mm -hmm. all these systems of thought uh, tie in together quite nicely, I think. Oh, they do. It, I mean, the holy, I mean, the microcosm and a macrocosm after Pythagoras came along, it really defined Western esotericism. Um, once again, I mean, even Neoplatonism is sort of influenced from uh, Pythagoreanism and Neopythagoreanism. But the only thing with Neopythagoreanism and Pythagoreanism and Platonism and all this um, is that we I don't think we'll ever know what true Pythagoreanism was, but we know what Neopythagoreanism was. But Plato, he, he knew about the Pythagoreans. And it was interesting because he said God has to be, you know, when we look at this idea of God into one, it, what, what, a kind of, I would have to say Pythagoras, what he did to the pre-Socratics was he goes, you guys can have your fancy poetic cosmology, but I'm going to graph this out. I'm going to make this logical. And he kind of did what Aristotle did to Plato. He made, he took the opposite approach of Plato and he made, his philosophy very rational. Um, so he pretty much stripped and he made, he said something so sensible, but at the same time, he hurt the poetic and artistic side of philosophy to some extent. That's what Pythagoras did, but it was Plato that reintroduced the pre Socratic stuff with the Neoplatonic stuff, saying that there's got to be more than math, there's got to be more to the macrocosm and microcosm than this. So then we get the expansion upon the word logos and uh, the demiurge and stuff like this, um, especially logos. Logos is kind of like the, the world of ideas, the world of shape and forms. And um, now I'm just ranting. But, uh, <laughs> Not at all. Yeah. It's a, no, it's beautiful. So let's take it forward a little bit, uh, the concept of the holy guardian angel to maybe um, Crowley even. And because you 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 did, and I mean, Crowley's influenced all modern magic, whether we like it or not. And let's not be too hard on him. Uh, mm -hmm. You did follow Thelema for a while, and I think you gained some uh, good stuff from there as well. I presume. Yeah, that's where I got my starting point at. Um, but the thing is, I mean, Crowley he didn't even touch a tenth of what philosophy touched on the Holy Guardian Angel. I mean, honestly, his essay, I think it's right around 15 pages, I forget. It's just a short little essay in book four. And Crowley couldn't make up his mind as to what it was. And it's not to criticize the man. I mean, I equally like as as much as Crowley as anyone else does. Um, I disagree with all, a lot of his concepts. But he kind of, when it comes to the Holy Guardian Angel... And his approach to it, he didn't even scathe the surface. And he couldn't make up his mind. If you go through his literature, uh, I've been scouring it the past 10 years, he couldn't make up his mind whether the Holy Guardian Angel was internal or external. He couldn't determine if it was a real spirit or inside of him. Yeah. But, but the pre-Socratics and the philosophers, they're very, they very clearly, I mean, very clearly... Um, state that you know this is an inner and outer thing. I mean, there's no ambiguity there. He he just didn't search in the right places. Uh, so, you, but it must be possible to attain what he described as knowledge and conversation of the Holy Guardian Angel through Thelemic uh, methods, because there are. Mm -hmm. uh, Thelemites that have achieved to Holy Guardian Angel, I believe. Oh yeah, there's a ton of different methods um, uh, to do it, but the, but they all require about the same thing. It's a purification process, and uh, purity is always so important to any form of practice because you have to strip the ego. Like um, for example, when we look at Kabbalah, um, the Holy Guardian Angel is a teferit. And a lot of people like to attribute Kabbalah to places like Egypt, uh, the Middle East, and, and things like that. But actually, no. Um, 
Kabbalah was actually very much influenced um, by European Jews, specif specifically they were Spanish. And these Spanish Jews, um, they, they got their influence from Pythagoreanism. Actually, if you go through an in-depth study of Kabbalah and you, and you find its roots in, in, in Spain, you'll find, uh, a, once again, a lot of philosophy during the Dark Ages and right around this period that where literature, especially from Constantinople and from all around the Mediterranean, made its way in, into Spain. And, um, and, 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 and actually the Jews, uh, here's, here's the thing too, a little off topic, but it's interesting. People don't realize the Greek influence on the Jews. It happened after the burning of the set of the second temple. Um, the, after the burning of the second temple in 70 AD, um, the, the, there, there was a mass migration of Jews. And um, they were all in Alexandria. Uh, one of the a second generation Jew in Alexandria was also a famous philosopher and theologian. His name was Philo. But we get this idea of what uh, Judaism was about with the um, uh, with, with this, and and we have his writings today, uh, Josephus, and with with Josephus. Um, it's it's very important to realize that um, you know Judaism, and which kind of which is also heavily inspired from um, Neoplatonism as well. You know because you have the higher soul and lower soul. The Jews they really didn't have a place to call home for a while. So uh, the actually at one point the Alexandrians held the largest Jewish. Um, population. Uh, so I think it's really important to realize the importance of Philo and how this idea of God and, re and all of this, especially in Jewish history, how the Jews affected this idea of purity. They even adopted some of the Greek ideas of purity. Um, uh, because when you're going through some of the ideas of purity with the holy guardian angel it's more than just stripping yourself it's about cleansing your mind cleansing your body being disciplined can you fast for a day what's going to be your fasting diet because that's the thing is it's discipline and i and i i i did a fairly long video about the idea of discipline and purity and um because once again if you're going to uh, you know work with a holy uh, sort of entity what you have to do is you have to um, try to become holy yourself. And uh, of course, there's going to be flaws. Of course, some people are going to take it too far. But at the end of the day, it, it is about purity. So um, it's about that discipline. Actually, Epicureanism is a perfect example. In Epicureanism, it, there's still pleasures and desires. And when it comes to um, at, like desires, Epic, uh, the, in Epicureanism, uh, which was inspired by Epicurus, he said, I would have to say it's the process of the Holy Guardian Angel is a lot like this. It's a minimalist thing. You know, you would eat certain foods and you would only taste like you would, let's say you're eating honey and bread. Like you would be thankful for the pleasure of how sweet the honey and the bread and the butter are, or you would be very thankful for this technology that we have. And this is a part of, this is why I think Epicureanism in some ways is related to the discipline of the Holy Guardian Angel. Yeah, that's fascinating. Mm-hmm. Um, so, <laughs> difficult to, to, for, for people with busy lives, magicians, you know, that have got jobs and just regular lives to sometimes imagine attaining that sort of dedication and that sort of, I mean, did you attain your Holy Guardian Angel while you were holding down a job or did you go on like a retreat <laughs> or was it just through daily practice and, you know, sort of chipping away? 
Oh, no, I was a bum on the street. What are you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> I'm joking. Uh, I, was, <laughs> I was working. Um, but this is where the other part of the practice that I failed to neglect because there's so much to it. A big part of the practice is just simply being a decent person because when you're applying these principles, what you have to do is not just conceptualize them, not just philosophize on them, not just theorize them, but apply them. So what aspects do you need to do or do you need to apply to your actions? Because it's kind of like school. If if you're in school and you're learning the material, but you're not using it, then what's the point? Um, you know, it's about the practice and the application. So, for example, be a good person. Um, you know, we have the ego, which gets angry, and it causes us to lash out. And we all fall victim to it sometimes, and it's good to vent that out in a healthy way. Um, and... And then there's our ego want, that wants to believe things that never happened. And, um, and there's things in our life that, that occur that we think happened that never did. And it's all a matter of perspective, but perspective doesn't mean truth. So in order to, re to remain truthful, we have to do the best that we can in order to really apply these principles and take responsibility for what we do. Um, and it's about ownership. That's the main thing. Yeah. The, this whole, the whole thing is about ownership of yourself. Yeah. You really have to be responsible for every little uh, thought and thing that you do. That's part of the process. Mm hmm. Yeah. And it's about not just retaining the process either. Um, a lot of people get get this false notion that okay i found my holy guardian angel that's it i'm done i did it they treat it like getting a new paycheck i got my paycheck that's it i'm going to spend it and and i'm going to find another job um but i think a lot of people treat that too casually so the holy guardian angel and people treat it like that and and and, and it's almost like they negate the experiences that they went through. And I read about this. So the people I've read uh, online forums where people talk about the Holy Guardian Angel, like so casually, they don't catch the in-depth stuff. And even Aaron Leach, he goes in-depth on his posts where people think they know what they're talking about with the Holy Guardian Angel. But in reality, they're just talking surface level. They don't catch the simplicity with the depth of it either. And it's just, oh, well, you know, my holy guardian angel is, is Ra. No, it's a, this is personal. So it, once you find your holy guardian angel, it's personal. It's, it's, um, and what's important about this is that once you find it, that you retain it. Like, after I found my angel, I never stopped my prayers. I never stopped re reading my texts. I've I've never stopped being inspired. I've always had an aim to my life. I, you can say that I've always had my goals that that I may never reach, but but I certainly do my best. And um, there's that divine inspiration that I find anecdotally that really keeps me going, and it's it's really important. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Fantastic. Yeah. yeah, it never ends. It's a never ending process. You know that song? This is a song that never ends. The lamb, the lamb chop song. That's yeah. the Holy Guardian Angel process. Yeah, yeah. The, the magic. The magic. never ends. It's never ends. You know, you reach the, the goal. It's the, it's the searching. Mm hmm. Yeah, it's. It, it is this constant renewal all the time when you are uh, going on this journey. And on this constant renewal, they always catch an aspect that you never caught before. Like when I told you how I reflected back on, you know, what should I call this language? And uh, this girl said tote. You know, it, it didn't make sense at first, but then later on it did. And you start to catch all this. And, and you go through stuff now and you look back, it's like, 
Wow. Yeah, I've I've gone through that. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, meaning comes from unexpected places. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's that's the whole thing is because you're we're overwhelmed with so much data going on in our minds all the time. We're always so absorbed in the present. Sometimes we, <laughs> when you do get that chance to look back, uh, it helps you analyze the puzzle and put the puzzle pieces together and that and and the ritual never stops it never really does because your angel um me and Talison, we was working on a project with the uh, olympic spirits and i was meant to come across the olympic spirits uh we was a part of this group and i know you wanted to talk about the paranormal thing that yeah. happened during that period oh, definitely yeah, which sort of led to traditional magic, and um, at least more so. I was already doing traditional magic, but this kind of amplified it. It was kind of weird. Uh, so you know, we we were we were working with the Holy Guardian Angel, at least I was, and then um, Clint or Tallison, he he just randomly sends me a message. He goes, there's this art, there's this really simple grimoire. We should give it a shot. It was published in the late, um, the late 1500, no, early 1500s, late 1500s, something like that. Uh, I said, okay, I'll give it a shot. I don't know. I don't, I don't let people influence me like that. I just say, okay, I'll take a look. And I read it within a day. I'm like, yeah, we'll, we'll take on the Arbitel of Magic. Uh -huh. I can handle that. But there was an issue with the process that I didn't catch, and I'll talk about that later. We was... Uh, doing the dream work with these Olympic spirits and the person leading this group was, was an author. And, uh, and it, uh, the first week it was all good. And it, and I could tell these were the lower level spirits at first. Uh, I couldn't tell at first, but, but I, they didn't feel divine. They had a weird feeling, but we, we, we had these amazing dreams um, and all of that. And we were recording this all as a group. But soon afterwards, oh my God, man. Uh, I, I got a poltergeist in where I lived. Yeah. A poltergeist. Yes. And I'm like, where, where the hell is this coming from? And then I start, then I contacted Tally Sin. I'm like, hey, I'm having some really weird activity. <laughs> and, you know, just venting. He goes, Mine just randomly picked up too. My girlfriend and um, my mother got attacked too. But then they, they had experiences and we was all in this group. And then we realized, oh, wow, something's going on here. We stopped and I, and I didn't read her book. Uh, you know, I trusted her because Clint mentioned it. So I picked up her book and reading through her book doing, and she practice more from the stance that these spirits aren't real but they're just a part of our subconscious <laughs> and in one part of the book these spirits they turn their back on them they turn their back on them and they said what should we do with this cohort that's directly written in her book and i'm like whoa that's really weird to work with these spirits you know what i mean so um it gets even crazier from there. Then later on, I read in her book that she almost died in a car crash. Uh, that one of the authors, uh, that one of the people, they were hospitalized for a year. And another person almost got deathly ill after after these experiments. Oh, oh. And we were having poltergeists. And I'm like, we're like oh my God, what's going wrong here? Well, we fit. Oh my God, she was Easternizing a Western grimoire with specific techniques. And which and which, which entities which entity were you uh, evoking? Uh, uh, this, they were supposed to be the seven Olympic spirits, but uh, but with her methods, I think we attracted something else. It wasn't the Olympic. Uh -huh. it, they were lower level spirits, and and um, and I and I called Tallis and I'm like, dude, I just read the book. You I, I gotta read you these quotes. I cannot do this anymore. And he was more somewhere on defense of like, well well if we leave, then the spirits, you know, what if they turned her back on us if we pissed her off, you know? And I said, Man, 
let her do it. I'm going to go back to back to my whole traditional thing, and uh, and I left uh, without consequence. I just kind of backed out, and uh, he eventually left too. And then we we both did a couple of the psalms and and, and the traditional purifications, and um, and his family did it too, and it all stopped. It all stopped. Okay, I'm glad. So, about yeah, and it's funny because this spawned something else. Uh, I I had uh, it's actually on camera. I have a CCTV camera. That was like the shadow person on my door. I, I showed it to um, one of my friends. I couldn't believe it. It's, it was in the shape of a person. And um, but afterwards, it was kind of funny because some of this I think was meant to happen because it, it sparked a huge debate. Uh, later on because it was soon after that experience we real we started working out of the arbitel of magic more traditionally and we got really good results really good results so we found out for one mentalism doesn't work you know when you're trying to easternize a western grimoire the results are atrocious and I've had a couple of friends working out of the left-hand path, you know, rewritten books using the same sigils and also poltergeist and stuff happening there. So, um, so we created this group called, uh, originally it was called, uh, the pre-Christian, uh, grimoire and magic of antiquity. And, and we started kicking people out because we're like, no, this is not a ne Necronomicon group. This is not a, um, this is not a 21st century grimoire group. And it was from that experience, you know, it, we respect it, but, but it, you know, this is about the historical and the academia behind these books and techniques. But we, uh, we kicked out this big author and, and a couple of their friends because they did not follow the rules. And this sparked a big thing in the community and there were even there's even several podcasts where they hinted our names, and um, then they um, uh, it was kind of funny because then it sparked this whole new debate: traditional magic versus modern magic. That was never the intention, but but it but it blew up to something bigger, all because of that poltergeist experience and the creation of that group, and it, and and the conversation is still going today because we created that group and because of that experience and just because we pissed off a hand uh, you know a handful of two you know like two two authors that didn't like it so and and it's still going on today and yeah, i think well, that, well. yeah but that's that's a, that's a part of the holy guardian angel process though you know something bigger to happen yeah, yeah, and the, the, yeah, the, the, yeah, the, not just psychological, psychological. These, these spirits, spirits angels, and, and grimoire spirits, spirits have spirits. an objective ex existence, you know, they're not just in the mind of the magician, and that was a, a, a surprise for me, really, because I came back into magic thinking it, I'd got it sorted, and it was all psychological, and then mm -hmm. the further I go in, I find out, no, it's not psychological at all, these, these spirits are real. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's what my holy guardian angel led me towards too, uh, over the years. Um, but I, I, I just didn't have any clue of how big stressing that argument would be, and 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 um, going through. And we've gotten testimonials from people who underwent the same shit. And these these people aren't even Christians, you know what I mean? Uh, they a lot of them have, um, you know. It's kind of dropped the um, they've dropped a lot of that um, the, the Christian stuff and they're just practicing you know uh, and it's weird because they don't have the same dogma they don't have that same subconscious belief as far as I know and they've gotten that result so so it, it, it's kind of wild uh, and I think my holy guardian angel really drove into this uh, whole argument that um, what's where I'm, I'm thinking of my holy guardian angel really intentionally I think kind of pushed this narrative of traditional magic and modern magic 
see modern magic it's more individualized and um but uh, then you have and there's more subjectivism and here's the thing the subjectivism turns to solipsism and and narcissism as well and um i've actually caught you know what i mean and my holy guardian angel sort of led me down this route to kind of look deeper into this issue i didn't plan on on uh, stumbling into this issue my holy guardian angel though it led me right into the lion's den and who was it it was Plotinus that said when you learn something and when when you start to apply something then then you um really begin to uh use this wisdom not for the sake of self but for the sake of other people and that's one thing my holy guardian angel also taught me about classical magic and we see it in the grimoires it's not just about you it's just not about your individuality it's about what do you contribute to society and i was meditating and you i think he's in my chat and you said how do we measure results and i meditated on that for a couple of days uh, because i and i talked to my angel it's like how do we do this and my angel said pick up this grimoire and read it you know, read these particular books, and I did, and it led me to the conclusion that the results are not just subjective, it's something that other people see. Like, if you're doing rituals, and you're living in your mom's basement, and you're not going anywhere, then your magic's in ineffective, everyone can see it. But if you're doing magic to advance yourself, then, um, and, and you actually are getting places, people may, they may not know about that ritual, but your measurements are determined by the success that you have, and they can see that success. And um, that's how the results are measured. It's, it's more objective. It's not as subjective at all. And that's the one thing that my angel has been leading me towards and, and to reapproaching some of these old books that I'm going to, like the sixth and seventh books of Moses and uh, uh, the Sword of Moses and some of the more classical Hebrew stuff that Erla is really forcing me towards <laughs> in a good way, in a good way. Yeah. Well, it's always good to uh, learn more and more. You never stop learning. Oh yeah. I think my Holy guardian angels brought some awesome people into my life as well. Um, I think it was destined that I meet Taliesin. It was destined that I meet Erla. I've made some wonderful friends over the years. Um, I've met you. Um, my holy guardian angel has, conne has connected me gratefully with, uh, uh, originally with authors, right? But I never thought I'd be so close to where these people aren't authors anymore. I, I got to know them as people. And, um, you know, one, one of my heroes was Jason Augustus Newcomb. And, um, you know, I, I and I, here, here I am. I'm talking with him about all of this stuff now as an equal. And um, it's kind of neat because at the end of the day, when you listen to your angel, I mean, I never thought that I, I would, you know, be as far as I be as far as I am without my holy guardian angel. Personally, it's le leading me on this philosophical journey. It's leading me to new to meet new people with new knowledge, like. Erla, she what she did was, she um she, my angel kind of, kind of brought me to her um because I she kind of solidified what I was looking for in the beginning in, in 2013, you know uh, things outside of Platonism and Neoplatonism. She introduced me to the pre-Socratics. She introduced me to Epicureanism and and Axagoras and all these other fragments and other philosophies and she has a BA in philosophy and, and, um, th and there's a reason why all that happened. It's, it's not an accident. I think we both look back and we're like, wow, you know, just the circumstances that all this happened under with the timing yeah. and, and that's a part of it. Yeah. Sometimes when you look back on, uh, a few years in magic, you think, well, it couldn't have really happened any other way. I had to meet this person, or I had to have that conversation, or I had to pick up that book. So I think we're all guided in a greater or lesser way. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, especially um, there's a couple rituals that I that I found too out of grimoires. Um, one is a prayer to the Holy Guardian uh, Angel. Uh, rituals for uh, a Holy Guardian Angel, or you know. Um, I there's a couple prayers that I can that I can give you. One is out of the Lamegaton, and the other is out of the Book of Oberon. So um, that's the main thing. Oh, someone just mentioned a feed. No video feed. Uh, uh, well, here's the thing. I, I'm on a hiatus after my year break, uh, so I can analyze everything and get it right. So um, I, I'm just not on video because I, this is my hiatus. This is my vacation. And that that's just something that I was guided to do to improve things. But when it comes to the holy guardian angel and all of this uh, you know it'll teach you so much about philosophy it'll take you to sources you never thought now why is this objective uh you'll get key words of books right and it's wild um when we was researching the olympic spirits uh Taliesin would have these dreams and i would have other dreams of certain words you know, and then I would Google the word, and it's a grimoire. Yeah, yeah. And then we would go in there, and it, there would be a mention of an Olympic spirit. So, and these are words that I don't even know. Some of them are in Latin I don't understand. So we would find these words, and and there 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 it would be an Olympic spirit. So they're objective; they're not subjective. You know, I've same thing with the Holy Guardian Angel, and um, and its function. It's there to. Uh, help you, uh, you know, tell you what what not to do, and that's when it really kicks in. That's when this is how Socrates defines it: is it's kind of a warning of what not to do. And and, and as long as you don't do that thing, then you're good <laughs> to yeah, him. Yeah. But um, it's pretty wild, um, you know. And that's one thing I've learned is. When people create their own fantasies about spirits and holy guardian angels and stuff, a lot of it takes it from the from the approach of fantasy, saying this is all in my mind. But when you take that approach, you're not going to get names of books. You're not going to get these geometric figures or mathematical formulas that directly lead to this. Hmm. And um, it. <clears throat> you can't, I mean, can't. these spirits are going to call you stupid. <laughs> you know what I mean? These spirits, they're going to, they'll degrade you, especially, you know, they're, they're, they're going to build you up and they have a totally different personality. You know what I mean? So these spirits are, are forms that have been around for thousands of years, as far as we know, People as far back as time, don't they? Maybe. Um, I'm, I'm not, I'm not all the way sure uh, about that. Uh, I don't know how far back they go. I, I can't tell you. I mean, I can concoct a theory um, and all of that, but I don't know. Yeah. So have you done work with uh, grimoiric magic and Goetia and stuff, calling individual spirits with seals, you know, like the traditional Goetia methods? I've done a bit of the Ars, Ars Goetia, but I don't – I'm going to be honest – I do not like the Ars Goetia. <laughs> I don't like it because there's two Goetias. The Ars Goetia has 72 demons. And um, personally, I find the Ars Theurgia Goetia to be a lot more effective and, um, and a lot easier, actually. Um, I think the spirits, I mean, some of the spirits in the Ars Theurgia Goetia, they, they, they rank in the millions into thousands you know yeah so and they have a lot more legions than the ars goetia i mean actually i like the i i would recommend a lamegaton but the thing is when you do the lamegaton a lot of it is based off uh the 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 agrippa lineage in the agrippa lineage there's actually uh it had so much influence on the Lamegaton and Solomonic magic because the Lamegaton comes mainly from Tritemius or Trithemius, um, 
a friend of Agrippa. And then the 72 demons come from Weyer's book called uh, The Pseudo Monarchy or the False uh, Monarchy of Spirits. Yeah. And yeah, then and then the person who wrote the the Ars the Ars Goetia kind of ignored John Weyer's you know title you know the, you know the false monarchy of demons yeah. you know and uh, <laughs> and just created the Goetia out of that. But I like uh, I like the other parts of the uh, Le Megaton first and foremost, especially the last book, uh, sometimes known as Ars Nova. And um, the Ars Nova is the oldest book in the, um, in the um, Le Megaton, and it's the last book, but it's very good. Of course, there's, uh, you have to summon the, the four princes of hell in the Abramelin ritual, don't you? Mm -hmm. no. Yeah sub princes and stuff like that so it's it's weird to me that they still have this concept of they they are demons from hell uh, well it's not weird at all yeah it's not it's not weird at all really maybe from from the modern stance um and the thing is you have to well, first of all let's put this in context and not there's a point of the context this idea of divine punishment is not strictly Christian, and a lot of people, they forget that. So you have the infernal demons, and there are some classical religions that have infernal demons. I mean, it's probably not a normal thing today, but, um, you know, just like when we say aerial spirits, you know. And um, like I said, you know, where do these spirits come from? That's the number one question where do they come from yeah and we have to ask that philosophically do we know where they come from so to automatic so to automatically jump to the conclusion um maybe they are infernal spirits you know maybe they are aerial spirits or maybe they are celestial what the hell do we know so it kind of and the thing is, you know, the Egyptians, you know, they had a hell with spirits in it too. And I don't think a lot of people realize that, that the Egyptians also had a hell with spirits. So did the Greeks. So did many other cultures. So this goes beyond Christianity and Judaism, you know, and I wouldn't even call it superstitious. I mean, um, because... If that's superstitious, then believing in spirits is superstitious. So where do we draw the line? Where? How? Yeah, yeah. That is so, what to me today is uh, there is uh, you can't draw a line anywhere. It leads right back to the first emanation. Well, here's the thing, though, right? Um, and whenever we are doing this. If we're going to call like, you know, just because we may not, uh, some people may not agree with the concept of hell, it's easy to label that as superstitious, you know what I mean? And just because, what if someone disagrees, believes in hell spirits, right? But they don't believe in aerial spirits. They would also call the people who believe in aerial spirits as superstitious. So once again, where, or or let's say, take another standpoint. You have rationalists who would call believing in spirits as superstitious. So the thing is, and I have to reiterate it because it's so important, where do we draw the line of what superstitious means? And that's the big thing. Where, where do we um, take that? You know what I mean? So um, I think it's really important because there's these issues that we have and this is what one of my favorite um, professors talks about, and he does lectures on philosophy and ancient Greek philosophy. In order to be human, you have to have, have an issue. Because when you don't have an issue, then, what, then, then what's the point of living? How do we prosper? How do we look into this you know what i mean if we didn't have this dilemma what would this 
knowledge mean? If we knew everything, what would it be? So that's the main thing. And, you know, some people, what they'll do is they'll let um, certain things dictate them. You know, even our own ideologies become our own dogmas. You know what I mean? Yeah. Oh. And and um, when we when we when we think about this, um, when do our own ideologies become our own personal dogmas? That's the main thing. Once again, where where do we draw the line? Yeah. You know. It's a good question. Uh, ideologies, uh, you know, having a fixed mind about anything can be, because you're always going to learn something new and you always seem to move on no matter how long you've been, you know, uh, I've been in and out of magic for a few years as well. And you always think, oh, this, uh, well, <clears throat> you reflect and realize that you've, it's always a constant process of learning mm -hmm. and learning and, yeah, endless. Well, so I think. I think everybody has a. I don't think dogma is completely a bad thing either. Um, ne neither. Well, and there's a good reason for this because some people, and I think we all have a set of dogma that we follow or some sort of. Um, and this draws me to something that me and Talison talk about sometimes. It's mine, of course, it's not. It's not subjective. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So this is something me and Talison talk about on the occasion. Is, is dogma necessarily bad? Is ideology necessarily bad? It's, it's really not. You know, if some people didn't, you know, we all have a, a form of dogma that we follow, you know, you know, a credo, if you want to call it a credo as well. We all have a form of um, belief. We all have a form of uh, cognitive bias that control us. And, you know, there are several channels that like to throw stones at glass houses that I've seen on, on this platform, but yet they also live in a glass house. So, you know, it, at least if you make a, I think, and, and, and that's fine. It just means that you have a form of ideology or dogma that you're governed by. You know what I mean? Whether it's self-imposed or, or mass massive, it, because they, it gives us some sort of guidance. It gives us some sort of morals and, I think that me and me and Erla, we've also had good discussions about this. You know, the uses of dogma, you know, how it keeps society functioning, the, uh, how some people need it, uh, yeah, at least how they need mass-produced dogma, some people, how they need uh, self-imposed dogma or ideology. You know, because what if, let's look at ideologies, right? Uh, I'm not going to lie, I follow an ideology that these spirits are real. Right. So let's take more, um, you know, other motivational stuff. Let's take a movement. I mean, the thing is, when we look at this idea of, of, of an ideology, an ideology gives us a reason for living. It gives us principles to live by, you know, and um, it's very important. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Uh, we were talking uh, earlier about like virtue, just like um, kind of old-fashioned things like that. You know, it became very unfashionable in the postmodern magic to talk about. Uh, you know, it was all about being a bit edgy and a bit dark mm -hmm. and satanic. You know, but I think the more you really meditate and and do real, I hate to use the word spiritual all the time, but you know, uh, when you do real spiritual practice seems to uh, make you a nicer person as a byproduct. Oh, yeah. Then you have the other extreme as well. You have the light workers, the new agers, <laughs> who take the entirely opposite ideology or extreme. And, um, you know, they'll take those virtues and they'll, and they'll turn it into something horrible, you know, such as the same, same things I talk about with purity and discipline and the light, you know, things like that. And even God, if you want to mention God in there, um, it's very important that that we have that balance because that's what it's about, is balance. And um, when we have this idea of balance, then what we have is this um, 
this middle road, you know, which helps us ascend the spine. If you want to use the chakras, that's the spine. spine. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the holy guardian angel. It, it'll set. It'll. It, it'll guide you a certain way. And um, yeah, there are edge lords. You know what I mean? <laughs> that's like, and that that that's quite a common term. It's people who intentionally gravitate towards dark things oh, just for yeah. the sake of attention or branding or marketing or something, right? Um, and then you have people doing quite the opposite. People, you know, making thousands and millions just off marketing the light and talking about enlightenment. Quite the contrary, you know, yeah. dressing in all white and angels and all this. And and anyone with an ounce of sense can 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 catch it right off the bat to see what they're doing. So it's it's all about balance. Mm -hmm. and it's not hard to see who's genuine in the even in the YouTube universe. Uh, you know, there's a yeah. lot, a lot of gur gurus out there uh, who are really saying nothing. Yeah, and and you know that's where I think real wisdom. Um, uh, call you know kicks in and like Plotinus says because when you do achieve a certain amount of knowledge and wisdom and once you are guided by your holy guardian angel in some sort of way once you are guided by that divinity you have to face these problems even if it means your reputation being torn even if it means you you're sounding like a contrarian when that's not really the um, the the purpose or the intent and you got to face these bravely, and and it forces you to be true to yourself. It forces you to constantly yeah. improve, and yeah. that's the whole point of it. Yeah, it's like a magnifying glass, and uh, it's it's very re just reading philosophy can be very uh, enlightening on its own, you know. So, do you still uh, do like daily ritual practice? As would you call it ritual practice? Yeah, very much so. Um, uh, I, I do the circle of EIO every day. I do have a standard of working with the um, Holy Guardian Angel and the Olympic Spirits. I also have my own working table that I work out of daily, the one that I told you about earlier on here. Mm -hmm. And, um, and you know, I've, I kind of have my own set of, set of prayers that I do. Uh, I'm still heavily inspired from the. Um, let's. I'm still heavily inspired from things like the Zohar and the Torah. And um, and the purpose of discipline, and all of that, and the purpose of all of this, um, like some. I've I'm at the point to where I write my own rituals now. Um, I don't necessarily need too much of. Uh, any books to tell me what to do or any of that and i think that's that that's very important yeah that's the aim of every magician in the end isn't it to totally personalize his or her magic mm -hmm. yeah and i and i'm guilty i still go to catholic church for mass i mean mass to me is one of the most powerful rituals that still ran till this day i mean especially when you look at the purpose behind the catholic mass it, it's uh, is very powerful. Uh, if you, I don't know if you go through the rosary, but if you ever have a chance to, you do the Kabbalistic cross. Yeah, well, actually, the uh, there's called the mysteries of the rosary, right? And it's really interesting because, in the mysteries of the rosary, um, it, there's the mysteries of life, death, and rebirth for every single prayer when you're going through the rosary. And when you're going through that, then it hits you as plain as day of what's going on. You realize the beauty. You know, I think that I've gotten sort of this spiritual relationship, you know, not a literal one, but, you know, I, I want to say connection uh, with Mary, you know, uh, Mary and Catholicism. When I, 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 I still do the rosary, I tried to attempt to make my own rosary, but I didn't get the same vibe when I applied the same mysteries, there are some things that are, I think a little more traditional that cannot be replaced with the effectiveness like the rosary or the mass. And, um, 
you know, there's there was this Zoro, Zoroastrian right that I attended not too long ago, and it was it was absolutely stunning. This right has been around for over two thousand years. Yeah, I couldn't believe it. And um, you know, so there's a balance there. And I think once you accumulate so much knowledge, so much practicality, and so much wisdom and stuff to learn from, that that you are able to customize your own stuff. But in the same sentence, you know, give due diligence and participate in bigger rituals that are more religious based. Because let's let's look at the definition of magic, right? Now, magic today is what I would like to describe is entirely different than what it was. But magic used to mean religion. It's it's a really convenient word now. And it's really important to, to know what we mean when we say magic. Back then, if you can read, if you could write, if you were an engineer, if you were a mathematician, if you could do medicine, if you were pretty much a scientist, you were a magician. It was a vocation. It was a job. If you were a diviner, you were a magician. And it was about helping the community. You weren't doing mathematics for the sake of, I need a girlfriend <laughs> or uh, even though that could be a part of it. Um, it was all about the advancement of society. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Me, it was actually something called Phoenix Chastain. Yeah. And you, and you would call these spirits and you would w work with these seals and um, to get knowledge in your field, you know, that's the main thing. So, you would get knowledge in it. Let's say you saw Ruth were, were um, let's say a rocket scientist, right? Let's, let's take this modern yeah. day. If you were, and let, let's apply the past concepts today. If you were a rocket scientist advancing space exploration into outer space, we want to go to Mars. So a part of you would not just apply the, the magic of the science and in the physics and all of that our physicists today would be magicians empedocles would be no different than these people today so um let's say you're going out into outer space you already understand the the magic of science and numbers right so now you call the spirit of rocket science and you say, okay, spirit of rocket science, I am missing a mathematical formula here, something that I need to find. Can you help me get the answer in an evocation? And you do the evocation, you'd have your uh, questions written, and these spirits would tell you the science of rocket science, would tell you the answers of rocket science. So Does that you, make sense? Yeah, absolutely. So. Um, how do the spirits communicate their information to you? Ah, I'm, I can very much see them, and, and I'm, I'm a clairaudient uh, and, a, and a clairvoyant, especially in evocation. Um, a lot of times they, I, I get different voices uh, in, during the process, and I don't even go into a hypnotic trance. I think that whenever people... Um, say they have to go into a hypnotic trance in order to achieve these results. They're not doing something right because it's it's an excuse for lack of results. And and, and let's face it, um, it goes back to Agrippa when he says not everybody is born a magician. You know, because a magician is a vocation. It's not a hobby. It's not a spirituality. It's a job. It's not a hobby. <laughs> yeah, it's not a hobby. It's a job. You know, mm -hmm. because back then, magicians, they were ambassadors, they were mathematicians, they were librarians, you know. And um, make a long story short, I won't hold you up for too long on this. Not everybody has the capability of, of magic and not everybody has the capability of doing this. It's like the NBA, you know, if you're if you're four foot nine and overweight, then or the athletic or the physical appearance to be an NBA player, you can try to join the NBA. Hey, you know, you have equal opportunity, 
but not the quality of outcome. So you're probably not going to be a good NBA player for four foot nine and overweight. So not everybody's. So when we treat magic more like a vocation, and uh, when we try to treat it that way, it makes more sense to the old world view of magic. Excellent. Right. What, do you think we should go into uh, questions? Because I've seen David Lux yeah. putting a good one here. Uh, right. Which references prove the Emerald Tablet is Pythagoras? Uh, the Pythagorean source book, David. If you actually go through there, um, if you look at the Tetractus, this is something that I put together. It says everything came from the one. Then you have the sun and moon. So it's breaking this down. In a, in a more cosmological thing. So you have the one, then you have the sun and moon and opposites. And then the miracle of one thing, which is the triad and the tetractus. Then right after the tetractus, you have the physical manifestation of the world, which is the tetrad um, and the tetractus. So if you actually go through the Pythagorean cosmology, um, you'll see the monad, dyad, and triad. And those are all represented and the, um, you know, then you'll actually go through the the Emerald Tablet and you'll see the same stuff. Um, it was an observation that I made. I ran it by my friend who is a historian. You know him. Um, but I ran it by him. Oh, yeah. yeah. And um, he's real deep into philosophy and historiography and the philosophy of the Mediterranean. Oh, yeah. And, 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 but. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I spoke with him about it. He goes, yeah, that was the philosophy at the time. So, um, and he's getting his PhD in history. So that was sort of the cultural uh, influence at the time. Pythagoras, once again, he changed all of Western esotericism. You know, you have the monad, which is the one, the dyad, sun and moon, you know, how they create the miracle of one thing, the triad, and then the manifestation on earth. You know, when it talks about, yeah, it, it's really deep. Fantastic. Right, Sam is asking, uh, Robert, will you please mention the importance of EMX, uh, sorry, EMF and the spirit box? Um, yeah, sure. Well, that's that's one thing that we, we um, me and Sam did a while back. And, and it's interesting because I think it's important to bring new technologies you know i don't i think that we should progress and will someone may mistake me strictly as a traditionalist when that's far from the case because i do believe in progress but progress with discipline and this is one of those um disciplines as we progress so with the spirit box i actually uh made one of my own out of a out of a memorex uh radio and what's interesting here, most of all, is that when we look at this idea of the spirit box, it's it's a way to where anyone can hear a spirit. Um, I've gotten name of demons and ritual out of the spirit box. And um, I've also, with the EMF, it's, it's kind of interesting because the spirits, what they'll do is they'll manipulate the sound in the spirit box. But but like the EMF field as well. And um, it said that they thrive off electricity. So, and also water and a handful of other things. It's, it's, a, little, it's a little deep to go into science-wise, but um, technology, especially those two pieces of, and actually I have my EMF and uh, spirit box beside me right now, along with a couple other technologies. It's kind of neat, but um but yeah, I think those play a very important part in evocation and spirit communication, which are almost the same thing. Yeah, excellent answer. Right, it's getting kind of late here. That was just uh, fantastic. It was my first, you're my first guest ever on the Saddle of the Mage channel. So thank you very much, Theophilus. No, oh, no problem. And uh, yeah, it was absolutely fantastic. I've probably got a load of questions that I'm going to think of uh, once I go, but I always leave it so late. But thank you. That was uh, brilliant, man. Thank you. Oh, I'm glad to be on. Thank you so much, too.
Right, I'll just uh, call out everybody. Can you see chat? Where are you looking on your phone or anything? Uh, uh, no, I haven't been looking at. Yeah. I haven't seen the chat at all. Just I, I just been looking at this blank screen with you talking and yeah. looking at my ugly mug. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's been good. We got deep. It was really good. So I've got Lisa F, David Lux, uh, Sam Shadows on the Productions, Alistair Lynch. Seven Serpents was in, Doc Illusion. I'm just scrolling through here. A few people watching, 15 people watching. DJ Nimbus was in, Oswald Spengler. Thank you guys, everyone, for watching. I'll be doing a, a normal stream in a couple of days where we'll get visuals back and stuff. Uh, thank you, Seven Serpents. Uh, Jeff, he was in for a while. Uh, VC was in, Orson Ryder. Uh, yeah, Robin Eagle song, brilliant. Uh, RC Veronsi from Australia. Uh, lots of good people, so thank you very much. Who, David? Beneficarious was in 93. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, no, Tamaningu. I can never say that. Sorry, Tamu. Uh, <laughs> it's my Scottish mouth. Uh, but thanks, <laughs> everyone, for, uh, for listening uh, and uh, brilliant excellent love you guys and we'll we'll speak soon and thanks yeah i appreciate all of you guys for watching it means a lot thank you yeah it was brilliant okay thanks guys see you soon ciao ciao see you later man 18 18 <laughs> over and out